Uh, so I'd like to start with a little background to introduce yourself. Uh, I started in uh, being interested in these things, Chinese Taoism, at a pretty early age. Uh, started out with uh, you know reading a book by called by Master Da Lu, Taoist Health Exercises, which was done back I think like 1974, uh, and Little did I know at the time when I was reading that book, the guy that was to become my teacher, Master Leong, he was living with him in New York at the time. So there's all these. But then I ended up, you know, doing things, blah, 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 maybe not correctly, but doing things. And then I ended up going to City of 10,000 Buddhas in uh, 1979. That was an incredible experience. I lived there for about nine months. Um, Came back, I went on a bowing pilgrimage, three steps and a bow for two and a half years. Right before that, I started, I was staying with Master Leon. I was learning some Tai Chi from him, but we ended up being such good friends that I ended up moving in with him. And during that time, I also became friends with uh, Roshi Katagiri, the guy that was running um, the Minnesota Zen Center. Really. He's got a number of books out. Really cool guy. And so I uh, uh, ended up uh, living with Master Leong after my bowing pilgrimage uh, for about, I think, eight years. I mean, we were always together. It was just a question. I moved out to my own place after a while. But, uh, and over that time, I have been because my main interest was always translating. And I think to date, I'm not even sure, but I think I've got 35 books that I've translated that are in print. Uh, the book that you wanted to, that you said you wanted to interview me about, Jade Emperor, that was actually my first Taoist book that I ever wrote. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Um, and... Uh, I like it a lot. <laughs> it's got a lot of good stuff in it for me. But, uh, so anyway, that's, you know, I, like I said, I, I've been in this for many, many since. Yeah, actually, it all started when I was 16. Uh, started with the Yi Jing. For some reason, my girlfriend back then bought me the Yi Jing book. I didn't understand a thing about it. But I sure like the things it said. I like the little, <laughs> the little verses like "Let your magic tortoise fly." All of that got got my attention, uh, and since then I've been involved, and I have uh, uh, got I've done so many things. But um, right now we're running, you know, I run a thing called Sanctuary of Dow, which is basically a virtual site because of the pandemic. That's right, right. I had to do the same thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, then, um, yeah, but we've been publishing for a number of years, uh, along with a student and partner, Patrick Gross. He's, you know, I, I make sure I translate it over. He, he's actually what makes it into a book. You know, uh, I, I don't have those skills. So, uh, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, that is my life, but, and it's been uh, it's been interesting, and hope I get to continue longer. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, with the um, can you elaborate a little bit on this uh, bowing pilgr pilgrimage? This is it the Dao. This is a Taoist practice, and you did this in the state. No, actually, it was a Buddhist practice. I mean, Taoists can do it, but so what it is is that in ancient China, not even ancient, actually, it's monks that even that have done it in contemporary times. I wasn't a monk. I was a lay person, but, you know, Yupasaka, as I call it. So I, you know, a monk would have done nine steps and one bow, you know, three steps and one bow. But since I was lay, I did nine steps and one bow. And I started it at the Minnesota Zen Center. And that's where I began it. And I made it all the way to 
uh, the border of Nebraska. I mean, I was making a, probably a good mile a day. <laughs> and uh, my original intent was to try to go all the way to California, but that, that proved uh, beyond my abilities simply because winters, I couldn't be on the highways during winter at all. And for a while, I had a, a person that would come out and watch my stuff and let me bow. And, and then I ended up, he left, and then I ended up having to do everything myself. Not whining about that. It was just difficult to try to keep up with, you know, doing all of that. Um, but it was interesting because I, um, God, I learned a lot doing that. And uh, it was, very intense. I mean, we, I had to do, I mean, I took vows to eat once a day, never eat food that I, I didn't carry money and that kind of stuff. So I had to, uh, whatever people gave me is what I could eat. Uh, it was a, I, I know I couldn't do it again. I'm too old for it now, but back then, uh, I really got a lot out of that. Mm -hmm. so, how was that received? And so I, I could I can imagine doing this in somewhere like India or Tibet, but not in America. How did how was the people give? I'm here was here's books. what was funny. When I started it out, people were really really worried about me, and I can't say that I didn't have some concerns myself. You know, it's like a lot of things in life. You think it's going to be one thing, and it ended up being another. I I actually was. I was still in shock. I mean, it was, the police were very good to me. In fact, I had a few towns where the chief of police would come out, sit down, bring me lunch. Oh, wow, that's great. And I thought I would have trouble with you know, the idea of, you know, kind of because I'm Buddhist and I'm in a Christian world. Yeah. Actually, I you know, what I found was Catholics really understood me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They really got it, you know. And they would come out, and I would. They would let me camp on their farm, and you know, do all these things. And they'd bring. Me. I only had a couple incidences that you could say were negative. Uh, for the most part, uh, everybody was so kind, and they really did kind of get what I was trying to do. Uh, I think the most outrageous one was we were coming into this is when a guy was with me and we were coming into this little town called Vista, Minnesota and he came back and as I got up from bowing he said when you get up over that hill you're going to be surprised and I go why and he goes you'll see so I get and I bow and I get up to the top and here it is the, the people of this town were lining both sides of the street and they got me to go to their city park, and they had a big lunch. And every, I mean, they really celebrated this dirty little Buddhist guy coming through their town. Um, and I just, you know, I, in retrospect of that, it, it really taught me not to judge people because these they were, I, you know, they were just wonderful, but. You know, like I said, yeah, there were a couple of people that didn't like me, you know, uh, and, you know, get off the road, you know, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, it was just really nice. It was a daily, real daily learning, hands-on experience. Uh, but again, I, I kind of look back at it and it's like uh, – some people can say, oh, that must have been really hard. Actually, for me, it didn't feel hard. It, it really didn't. I mean, I really actually kind of enjoyed living outside. Uh, I enjoyed practicing, which felt like it was you know, all day long, which was cool. And um, it was kind of a dream for, you know, this, you know, I'm just a, I was just a kid out of, a little Moorhead, Minnesota, who ended up, I still don't understand this, how I ended up meeting and being able to live at City of 10,000 Buddhas and learn from 
uh, Chan Master Xuan Hua, who's really one of the, this is, he's really phenomenal. He's dead now, but uh, City of 10,000 Buddha is huge. It's a really huge complex. Really, he was kind of like, I don't mean it quite like this, but he was like in China before Mao took over. He was kind of like the Pope. I mean, he was the big, the big, everybody wanted Chuan Hua. Um, and, you know, I, and then I ended up with Master Leon, being able to live with him. And the only way I can put it is I must have done something right in a past life. Because uh, this life, I, I don't feel I'm anybody special or deserving of all the attention I got. Uh, get, I, just, I just rack it up to luck. Uh, you know, and that goes with the fact that, you know, I think one of the things we learn about ourselves, and that's the point of cultivating, is that, yeah, I'm, despite all the things I've learned and despite the people I've met, everything in my life, I've met lots of great teachers. You know, it, it, it doesn't make me any better than anybody else. It just means, you know, you know, that's why, you know, I can see why people get into these. If they think they have a lot of money, somehow they're better than other people. You know, we shouldn't do that spiritually. Either. We shouldn't just look at, because we've had the opportunity for spiritual wealth, it doesn't make us any better than anybody else. And that's something that, you know, in America, you know, because you got to keep in mind, Asian teachings in general are pretty new to us. Right. Yes. And we're trying to adapt. You know, we're, there's this fine line between stealing a culture and and trying to adapt to foreign ideas. And the truth is, is we got to make it our own. I can say I'm Taoist, but I don't really like the term because uh, you know we we really have to learn how to make these teachings. You know, it's just like if you watch what's happened to Buddhism when it was India. When it was in India, they they looked almost Hindu in their. They did a lot of things with reincarnation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you know the different gods and stuff. Buddhism had to do that to survive. When it got to China, it took on a lot of Taoist ideas. That's why Chan Buddhism, you know, looks or Zen, as it became known Zen, just like Japan, it had to take on a lot of Shinto ideas. Every culture that Buddhism spread to, kind of borrowed from the culture they were in, in order to be accepted. And that's why I think here we find a lot of our spiritual teachings, which I have arguments about, but we're trying to adapt them to our whole psychological analytical brains that we got from our Western kind of sciences and religions. So in, in some ways we act, you can be a real Zen Buddhist, but you can really act kind of Christian. And you can start acting like a psychologist. You know, and that's all fine, but it's not, uh, it's not it. You know, psychology is very limited. Now, I'll tell you a story that made psychology fly out the window for me. When I was at the monastery, we were going through, unfortunately for me, when I got there about you know, a month later, we had to do this 21-day Chan session, which was 22 hours a day. You got to sleep two hours. You got to eat one time. The rest was pretty much just meditation. Really intense. Uh, but anyway, a nun had decided. She had a nephew who was uh, severely mentally challenged. Severely. And she thought if she snuck him into the city of 10,000 Buddhas and over on the men's side, that somehow this would eradicate his karma and he had become healthy again. You know, 
and yeah, she got him, and he ended up. The monastery was huge, and it was uh, uh, the bottom line. The story was is that he was he would go and hide. And I remember once I ran across him. He was in the kitchen getting some food late at night, and I asked him, "Just how are you?" And he went very trident, and he walked out and. I never had anybody tell me they were a three-headed spear before, so I didn't, I didn't know what, what to do with it. But anyway, this whole situation got kind of awkward. And so one evening in lecture, Xuan Wa, you know, kind of chided the nun, saying, we're not a hospital. We're a monastery. We're here to cultivate. And therefore, your nephew will have to go back. And then he told a couple of the other um, uh, uh disciples, you know, go off and, and find him and bring him back here. Now, I want to make this, because this is hard. This kid could not have a reasonable kind of conversation with you. It just wasn't in him to be able to talk with people in any kind of way of clarity, nothing. He'd always say weird stuff and he'd get really scared and run away and so anyway they bring him in and they manage to Shwanla has him to bring the, the kid up and he had the kid he said you know he says I'm old so help me here could you kneel down and the kid kneels down and Shwanla put his hand on top of his head to this day I do not understand this this kid immediately said in a very clear tone, not his mentally challenged tone. He said, can you help me? I want to get out of here. It's terrible in here. And I mean, we're hearing this. And Chun Ma goes, no, he said, this is your karma. You, previous life, you were an alcoholic. You abused your brain, and now you have to live a life of an abused brain. But he said, what I can do is I can give you three days of peace, and then you have to go back. And I'm making this story short, but for three days, you could talk to this guy. He could tell you things about his life. And when I talked to him, I go, what is this all about? And he goes, it's because underneath, no matter who we think we are, underneath, there is a consciousness. Sometimes they call it you know, your Hun spirit or your original consciousness, your primordial spirit, whatever, true nature. we got lots of names for it in different traditions. But he said, that's always been intact. We're just covering it up with all of our karma and our junk. And that's what we got to work through. And he said, I, you know, Shwanwa just gave this kid three days of clarity in hopes that that would help him want to work harder towards you know, doing good things in this life so he doesn't have to come back like this again. You know, long story, as I said. But that threw psychology out the window for me because there's no psychologist on earth that could talk that way or, or see it or experience it that way. And even though I think psychology can be very good, but that's kind of what's worked into our spiritual practices. You know, and we're always, there, there's an arrogance too. You know, the, uh, the Chinese, they've had medicine for what, 5,000 years? And I've, I've taught lots of, I've, I have a really good friend who's a doctor. And he went to China and he said he sat, you know, he was part of a whole contingent of doctors that went, this is many years ago, to look at acupuncture. And he said there was a woman that was having a brain tumor removed. She had no anesthetic at all. All they did was use acupuncture needles. And he said this woman laid on the table. And he said we were allowed to come in and we could talk to her while she was having her surgery. And she was clear. And they were asking her, do you feel pain? And she goes, well, some tingling, but it's not really painful. So with acupuncture, they are able to cut off these pain centers. So she could have surgery, 
without drugs. Now, and I, you know, Dr. Nathan, he was, this is not anything he made up. I mean, he was John Hopkins. He was, and that's what he changed. He said, when he came back, he said, we don't know a thing about the human body. Well, since then, they've discovered, you know, what does make acupuncture work. It's a new organ under our skin called the interstitium, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Interstitium. And now they're going, we know it's a little watery type of thing. And it's all this. That's why acupuncture needles only need to penetrate lightly into the skin. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could be a topic of our whole conversation, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting that... Uh, you know, when I when I look at all these things uh, that you know we're trying to gain from Asian teachings in this country, I think the one thing we got to be careful of is we sometimes you know I could sit here and talk to you at on a Taoist level, tell you that your cultivation has to start with you dealing with your seven bow spirits. Now we got a problem there. First of all, most people don't even know what a bow spirit is, mm -hmm. right? And we don't, you know, we don't really grasp it as such. And so what we have to do is understand that bow spirits are really the negative effects of our emotions. Mm. I mean, if you live in too much fear, anger, happiness, grief, sorrow, lust, or love, you can't cultivate. Right. You can't do it. And um, therefore, you have to learn to regulate them, not to get rid of them. Taoism says, no, emotions are good. It's good for us to fear things like putting our hand in the fire. That's right. a positive right. fear. Right. Uh, sometimes it's good to express a little anger, you know, when we, like when we're raising children. Sometimes we do have to say, Stop <laughs> with a you know uh, happiness. We got to be careful of that one because anybody that is happy all the time, they usually put a straitjacket on you and take you away. Uh, happiness is come and go. Actually, you know, sorrow and grief. You know, going quickly here. You know, that's the reasons for anxiety and depression and suicides. Except those are the negative parts. When those become too strong. Uh, and we know what lust does. You know, that'll totally distract us. And we can love too much. That's a bottom. We got to understand that love is wonderful until it becomes obsessive. And the negative stuff of jealousy, you know, control, all those come into it. And it's all, you know, because we think we're in love that we have to do that. No. You know, it's, so Taoism really, it, you know, even though I had a great Buddhist kind of background, I still am Buddhist. Don't get me wrong. I'm still a Buddhist. I'm just not a very good one, truthfully. Uh, I really like Taoism. reason I like it is because it, it teaches you. You're in cultivation. Okay, let me I'll make try to make this clear for you. If you decide that you want to go off and be a Zen monk or whatever, or Zen cultivator, you'll go join your Zen club, little wherever it is, and you'll go every morning you'll go down and sit. Every evening you'll go and sit. And about four times a year you'll go through some intensive where you go for three days, seven days. And the idea is you're going to sit in front of a wall, for the most part, and you're going to sit there until you experience emptiness. That's the goal, because from emptiness, the void, you can then experience enlightenment. That's the whole idea. Now, there's not much. When you go to Zen centers, there's not much about your body. There's not much about, you know, you know, the whole context of circulating your chi or doing any of that. In fact, as in Zen, if it happens, it's usually by accident. Which is really funny, because if you walk into any Zen center and say, who's your founder? 
they'll tell you it's Bodhidharma. Oh, really? Then why aren't you practicing muscle change classic and marrow washing, which are very similar to some Taoist ideas yeah. of circulating chi? They don't touch it. Oh, okay. they've, they've kind of eradicated that for the purpose of all that's important is enlightenment. Right. So they'd left the uh, you know muscle change and the marrow washing out of the picture. Now, this all goes to a statement that is made in almost, you can pick up almost any spiritual book. And they'll say, there'll be a verse that'll say, first in the body, then the mind. Mm. Or first in the mind, then the body. The latter is Zen. They're hoping that if they get the mind correct, the body will fall in place. Yeah. Taoism doesn't take that chance. Taoism is the former. Yeah. First in my body, yep. then in my mind. So Taoism yeah. is filled with these various practices mm -hmm. of learning about our body. And so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. So, so no. you're saying that the original, um, or so. If we if we take the Bodhidharma, right, it's a legend at this point, right? Yeah. If we take Bodhidharma, these original teachings, though, you're saying that coming from India, there were like body practices that came with the Buddhism yeah. and associated with Qi. And I mean, this is around eighth century we're talking, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we had Vajrayana. We had Vajrayana in India at this time, which is also um, Mahamudra tradition with body practices with the different. Mm -hmm. Hatha Salong stuff. So there's a, it seems like, so you're, so in this stream washed up there and it has a lot to do with Taoism. It's very similar to Taoist practices or they yeah. informed one another or what? See, first of all, Buddhism couldn't have even existed in China. It would have never got in if it wasn't for the Taoists. When you read the history of it no. back in the Xi'an era, you know, the city of Taoists found a lot of credibility in the Buddhist teachings, the, the Prajnaparamita teachings. Ah, uh, sure. Diamond Sutra, Heart Sutra. They yep. found that was like saying the same things they were saying. In yep. fact, you can look at the Heart Sutra and the Diamond Sutra and see a lot of similarities with the Tao Te Ching. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you can also find there's one of the main Chan texts called the Shurangama Sutra is very similar to what Chuang Tzu was talking about, non-production. Mm -hmm. So the teachings kind of had this early on, the Taoists were going, yeah, you guys, yeah, you're thinking right. And they were the ones that let them stay in their monasteries, their temples, their hermitages, and eventually started helping them build their own temples. This is very, this is long before Bodhidharma. And, you know, gradually though it ended up like, it ended up political. You know, Confucian, Buddhists, and Taoists were all fighting for the royal aristocratic favors to get money. But that's where the real separations happened. But, you know, in, in context, yeah, there's, there were traditions out of India up and through Tibet. Yes, that dealt like Dumo is a form of internal alchemy. And you can look at those things and go, well, what happened with Zen? You know, and now I'm not saying all Zen people. You know, I met, there's a great teacher out in New York called Chung Yan, and he does Tai Chi. He's a Buddhist monk, but he does Tai Chi. I think, you know, I think what happens is is that, uh, yeah, we you know, they became so focused on the the main goal that all the other stuff seemed kind of irrelevant. It's just like T T and I once we got hired by the Catholic Church to go teach twenty eight nuns Tai Chi. And this was hilarious, uh, but it. Weird, weird story. It was up in northern Minnesota. What was, and the reason was is that because the Catholic Church was realizing that they were spending a fortune on health care. 
because you know the priests and the nuns they're just doing mass for the most part they're too sedentary just like bodhidharma said the shaolin monks were and they developed health problems so now they were trying to they were brought in this where they have you know more organic food and what and they decided tai chi would be a really good thing to learn uh for them because it would get them up and move right now one of the hilarious parts about this was for me was the the mother superior of this particular convent was a former uh nurse we searched the records her name is sister pat zangs and it turns out she was the midwife when i was born at the hospital that is weird i'm going i just kind of like how does this happen you know i go to teach tai chi you know 50 years later and there's this, she went and checked the records and sure enough there i was you know she goes yeah i was there when you were born but getting back to that is it it's interesting you know cuz spirituality is not just a mental process. You, you, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't find much value in saying that I'm just going to focus. You know, and, and people, you know, you can make that. Here's the argument: is the story that we hear about Buddha going sitting under that banyan tree. But this is different. He spent years dealing with his body. Then he decided he really wanted enlightenment. So what he did, you got to put this in context. He went and said, I'm going to go sit under that tree. And I'm either going to get enlightened or I'm going to die. He didn't care which one it was. He had just had it. So he went and sat under this banyan tree. For 49 days. And yes, he did get enlightened. Uh, here's the problem with that. Who else can do that? You know, you and I are probably never going to make that decision to say, I don't care if I live or die. I'm going to go sit under that tree until something happens. That is, that's way beyond. You know, nowadays they would put you away for that. Because they, that would be like an attempted suicide. And, you know, you can look at it differently. I mean, most practices, we're, we're not doing that. We're not, uh, you know, Taoists look at it from the, from the standpoint that we're just trying to learn how to live well and die well. And in that process, if we can what they call return to the Tao. That's great. But no matter what, we're making progress. See, Buddhism looks at it as there's a wheel of life. Taoism looks at it as if there's a spiral. Because they're saying everything in nature, whether it's the solar systems, the universe, even a small little plant, it all makes use of spirals. Everything, we even come out of our mother's womb in a spiral. So they're looking at our, it, you know, Taoism doesn't have, you know, it understands rebirth. It's just saying it's on a spiral, and that spiral is headed towards the Tao. And so each life we try to make a little more progress on that spiral. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But the, the point that, you know, that Taoism is trying to get at is you have this body, and this body can be, a, as they're putting it, a great vessel towards your spiritual awakening. Use it that way, rather than just abusing it. You know, because that's, when we get into greed, which are, we, you, unfortunately, you and I are living in the era of greed. You know, if you think back, all the great buildings that were built were spiritual buildings. Right. Now they're money temples. And now they're banks. Yeah, that's all it is. And they're made cheaply, too, on top of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't. 
you won't find these buildings lasting 300 years like you find in Europe with cathedrals. And, That's or, right. I always think about that. What America's going to look like in 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, must. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, it's just that this is what, what has happened. You know, we, we decided to put uh, kind of the material over the spiritual. I'm not trying to be all cliche here, but it is true. And, you know, I just had this discussion with a student the other day, and he was feeling, he's, I just hate all this violence in the world and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like, you know, am I contributing to it? Is that, you know, and I'm going, no. Because here's here's the bottom line that every if you're engaged in a spiritual practice, even if you're not very successful, that's neither here nor there. You are putting an energy into the world that's very good, and you're not the problem. The greed is the problem, and if you're not necessary, yeah, we all need money to survive. It's our day and age. Can't get around it. We live in a country that requires it. If you don't, you don't have a very good life. You know, and you know, and as TT used to tell me, you know, monks don't want money. More the better. You know that. You know it. Uh, it isn't that money's bad. It's what we do with it that's bad. And there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. That's what I love about Taoism. They say, if you're born with wealth, accept it. If you're not, accept it. Don't be getting all, you know, kerfuffled by the fact if you don't, because that idea of, oh, I don't have enough money is what ruins us spiritually. Okay, so we were are talking about the body here. This takes us to the to the text, right? The Mind Seal Classic. In the, yes. The Three Treasures. Yes. Um, so as a Western practitioner, like you said, we're growing up in the West. We understand the body from a certain point of view. It, it seems like there's a disconnect sometimes like with these teachings. So how do we understand the body from from this lens? Like what can we do as practitioners to begin to understand these teachings? Well, here's what Taoism does. It's really unique. You know, and at first, terminology gets to this every time. Three treasures, Ching, Chi, and Shun. I can say that to most people, and they'll go, eh, what are you talking about? My teacher, Master Leong, he made it very clear. He said, you better figure out how to explain these things and how they work and why they work to a ditch digger. Because if you can't do that, your stuff is worth nothing. Don't talk in spiritual terms. He said, stay away from all that mystical talk. He says, all that does is frustrate people and make them feel inferior. So let's go back real quickly here. Jing. Taoists were very practical about this. Jing is your body. But what is your body? It's nothing but a bag of water. Just like Earth. I don't know why we call our planet Earth, because most of it's water. And our body is the same way. Without the fluids of our body, we are nothing but just dried, brittle bone with some dead skin hanging on it. That's it. Water is what gives us our shapes and etc. So we have all these water elements in our body. And, you know, the main one is blood. I'm going to go quickly here. If you, learn, if you can learn to breathe in your lower abdomen like you did when you're an infant in your mother's womb, your blood uh, uh, flow increases. And with that, you get more oxygen, just like when you go to the doctor and they put the little thing on your, they want to know your oxygen level. That's really important because but what Western doesn't go to is when you get more, the oxygen is good in your system, you get chi. Chi is basically heat. And if you're heating, you get movement. So the whole context of like Qigong is learning how to increase our circulation so that we get this heat so it penetrates our muscles, our tendons, and eventually the bone, which then turns, uh, that's the process for getting uh, bone marrow uh, increased. Bone marrow is the very basis of our immune system. So by learning these things, you are making yourself very healthy. 
if you're healthy, you get longevity. If you get longevity, you get more time to practice. Okay, <laughs> basically. But so we can look at, you know, Jing as being, that's why Taoists deal with the saliva, they deal with the blood, the sexual secretions, lymphatic fluids, uh, you know, marrow, both bone and what they call brain marrow, which is actually your uh, uh, spinal fluids. All of these things, yeah, you could take down, and even Kundalini, you can break it down. They're actually talking very medical to us. Once you understand, you know, Ida Pingala in Kundalini, that's the sympathetic, parasympathetic nerves. You know, and we they run up into our brain in both sides, left and right side. And that's, you know, we have to stimulate these glands inside of our brain. You got three of them. And we need to, they release certain hormones and different fluids into our system that bring us greater euphoria and greater health, etc. So these guys, they weren't talking mystical nonsense. Break it apart. It's very, very practical. So a Taoist first learns how to replenish this jing, meaning get the fluids of your body functioning right, because every organ in your body needs fluids. You don't have good fluids running through your heart, through your lungs, through your liver, through your kidneys. You're in trouble. You can't cultivate. So you have to take care of them. Yeah. You know, because that's what you're, you've got to keep your body somewhat intact in order for you to go through the rigors of cultivation. You know, it's why they call it cultivation. It's an interesting term because it has to do with growing a plant. So let's say you want a good tomato plant. So you go outside and you throw a tomato seed in the ground and then wonder why in the hell you didn't get a tomato. It's because you didn't go out and cultivate it. You didn't water it, get it the right sunlight, watch it grow, prune it, give it you know the nutrients it needs. So that in the end, you end up with a really nice, juicy tomato. That's you spiritually. If you're not going to feed it, nourish it, and take care of it, don't expect it. That's, you know, just like any, if you don't go to work, don't expect to get a paycheck. You know, it's that simple. We don't have to think beyond that. So then they go into, going quickly here, into the, the treasure of chi. Chi is your breath. And we forget chi is what gives us body warmth. If we didn't have chi, our, this body that we got from Jane cannot function. It's also what allows me to raise my hand up and down. Chi is first and foremost what animates you as a human being. This is absolutely necessary. So now you got this body, you've got this energy that can make the body function, and then there's spirit, which is different levels. But first and foremost, it's just your consciousness. Yeah, that, that word is weird for us, the word to say spiritual path and all this, because really we're talking mind, consciousness. Yeah, it's all in the end. It's all about mind. Mind, is, everything is created from it. Everything is it. You know, that's what, you know, the Taoism really, in the yin convergence, they, you know, everything is in the palm of your hand. Everything is a result of your mind. Uh, it's a weird translation into spirit, though, don't you think? Like, in the West, because we don't talk about consciousness in the West, really. No, but, you know, keep in mind that when, you know, Taoism talks about you've got two, two types of consciousnesses that are working with you. Hmm. One is the one you're using right now, yeah. your conscious spirit, your thinking. Conceptual. This guy up here is running rampant, trying to think of things to say, things to do, blah, 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 blah. And it's okay. It's just that we've got to learn to control it because it will cause enormous trouble. But the other consciousness we have is a spiritual consciousness. And Primordial consciousness. Yeah, and that's why, you know, you'll look in, like, you can, uh, different Taoist books. One that comes to mind is Taoist Yoga by Lu Kuan Yu. 
everybody has kind of seen. And there's in it a picture of a guy sitting in meditation, and there's a little sphere right above his head. And the texts, all the internal alchemy texts say, you get to the point where you realize a being outside your being. This is your true consciousness. It's not that it's really separate. That's just our minds, because we're so duality is everything. I can't think male without female. I can't think up without down. So therefore, there's we think two consciousnesses. But as every text will tell you, whether it's Zen or Taoism, it's not two. It's one. And that's what they mean. When these come together, that's the one. And that's why we train in meditation to be one-pointed. One-pointed concentration. This is actually what brings the left and right sides of our brain together as well. They function separately, but cultivation helps them become one. This is the whole thing like the master and the emissary and like uh, the golden flower, uh, lotus and all yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. It's all, actually, when you tear them all apart, they're all basically saying the same thing. Same thing. In Abhidharma literature, you find the same thing. It's a, Oh, yeah. Yeah. My problem with the Abhidharma is that, you know, the psychologists of the West love the Abhidharma. Well, yeah, and then which one? You know, the Mahayana. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> they kind of they went after it. Really, leaving them aside. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That is the Abhidharma. Thank you, because I do not want to go there. <laughs> no. <laughs> Taoism is just saying, you you got three components, your Jing, your Qi, and your Shen. And you got to cultivate all three in order for you to be what they call this immortal, which unfortunate term, actually, because in the West, we think immortal means to live forever. But it's very clear. I mean, there was a book called uh, uh, Understanding Reality by Chang Ho Chuan. And he says in the very first paragraph, if you're not practicing spiritual immortality, you're really not practicing immortality. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. What they're saying is you make the spirit immortal, right. not your body. Right. I mean, let's be realistic. Right. Who wants to be, uh, to live forever? Right. I don't. I, you know, I'm, I, you know, I translated this book called The Immortal, The 250 Year Old Man. And people always question, I'm just going, in our day and age, I don't, I don't think I, it, do I have to earn an income right. for 200 years? I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> you know, I, I just want peace at some point. And the other thing Taoism teaches you that, you know, I got this from my teacher really strongly. I remember one time I was talking about, you know, life and death stuff. And he said, when you go to bed at night, are you in a panic? And I go, no. I go, I lay down and I relax. He goes, that's exactly how you should die, idiot. <laughs> he was very abrupt. <laughs> but he's saying, why, why do you fear death? It's like going to sleep. If your spirit, if you cultivate and you make your spirit really strong, when you die, you'll have the clarity and the energy to go and do what you want to do. It's not a quite, most people unfortunately die in panic and fear, 911 calls, ambulances, doctors, nurses, you know, bells and whistles, people scream, you know, all these things go on in your own fears. Uh, it's no wonder that we have, you know, and I don't want to be rude here, but, you know, I've got plenty of nurses and doctors who are my students, and they all say it's not a pleasant experience for people when they die because of defecation, urination. Etc. And I've watched two people die. And it's interesting, the last breath is not from our Dantian, where, you know, when you were an infant, all your breath was in your lower abdomen. It had to be, because when you're in your mother's womb, you had to draw in through the umbilical cord all your oh, nutrients. Yes, yes, yes. That's where embryonic breathing comes from. Sure, sure. And so, but when you think about, as we go through life with anxiety, our chi keeps rising up. So our last breath, for most people, is this. <laughs> right from the throat, and then you pass away. Whereas 
It's not rocket science. That's why there's this propensity in spiritual teachings to say, keep your breath low in your abdomen. That's where, that's where it was when you came into this world and while you're in your mother's womb. That's your you know, primordial breath. That's how you get to it. And here's the other thing about what I always found unique was there's only one thing that separates you and I from life and death. And that is breath. If I'm breathing, I'm alive. If I don't, I'm dead. It makes breath pretty important. And we should really, you know, the ideas, you know, we talk about, like in meditation, people wanting to, you know, they have trouble because their mind goes crazy. And the solution to that is never your mind. Don't try to, that you can think your way into calmness and tranquility. That's using poison to fight poison. The idea is to focus and just sense and feel your breath in your lower abdomen. That's, that's the one pointed concentration because now you, that's the only way to settle your mind is through your breath. In fact, even in Western science, they, there's a book, and it's a great book for people to read. It's called The Second Brain. We know that we have a brain in our abdomen. It's the old statements, what does your gut tell you? You know, intuition things come from our lower abdomen, not from our head. And therefore, we got to learn to keep our breath low. So since you brought up the embryonic breathing, um, and then you earlier you brought up Eden Pingalus. Do you see that are these basically the same practices? Because I know there's an orbital breath with the Taoist, but then the in like the yogas in India you find it's a little more linear, not quite as circular, but is essentially the patterns the same? They're the same except mm -hmm. Kundalini Yoga, which is the energy coming straight up your body, is going through chakras. Right. So I can look at this and go, and I did this in my book called Refining the Elixir. Third eye, jade pillow, they're online. I got a solar plexus and then my double pass in my back, same line. Basically, the chakras are working the same areas as they do in Taoist, what they call internal alchemy, bringing energy up the spine, down the front of the body. Now, the, the missing piece for a lot of people is that they read, see, I'm not really in favor of a lot of Kundalini books that were written by Westerners. They got this idea that it's energy going up. And you experience you know, what we call in Taoism, uh, reverting Jing to restore the brain, where it has this experience. You know, like mine was, it wasn't a thousand lotus flowers, it was a thousand little like rice paper lamps. I don't know why psychologically that's what happened to me. Sure, sure. But, you know, and other people see lights. and But in the end, these are nothing but our neural pathways stimulated. That's mm -hmm. what we're seeing because our brain is filled with them. They're electrical. Yeah. So if we, anyway, thing here is Kundalini Yoga, for the most part, we think of energy rising up to the top of the head. The seventh chakra. Actually, if you start really reading the good works on yoga, they talk about the eighth chakra, which has to do with this right above the soft spot we had when we were a kid. Taoism deals with it. So does Kundalini yoga, but a lot of uh, people that write about it don't. And then there's this, uh, uh, I forget, forgive my Hinduism here. But there is a process that they call kachari, which has to do with the saliva and swallowing that down. Uh, that's kind of one of the, just like in Taoism, Taoism does the same thing. You bring, it's called advancing the yang up the back and yin convergence going down the front. And it has a lot to do with, you know, swallowing saliva is opening up what they call this renmo meridian. And there, that word too, I want to make it clear. Here's a, another point of confusion. There's two systems of qi meridians in China. One is called Weida, external 
elixir, it translates literally. This is where acupuncture comes from. Acupuncture meridians are hairline. You wouldn't even see them under a microscope, but the hairline. And you can, when you, you know, you go to an acupuncture, you can feel tingling sensations and you can feel heat because it's the movement of external chi. So you'll get those sensations. But that's not what Taoism is after. On the backside and inside of our spine, there's what they call nadon meridians. And these are like maybe the half size of what you'd call a garden hose. And you actually feel fluid flowing through them, not, you know, heat as, at, as such, like you do with Wei Dun. And this is why, you know, they call it an elixir for a reason. It's fluid. It has to do with when you cultivated your Jing and you got all these fluids in your body working right. Well, they, I once made a movie in England with this, for, it's called Returning of the Tigers. And in it, there was a guy, he was a doctor out of China and he really studied internal alchemy. And I thought he had the best analogy. I wish I would have come up with it. Uh, but he said, these, extraordinary subtle meridians these you got eight of them way down you got 14 major ones nadon you got eight and he said these are like dry river bits and when the snows melt or the great rains come the water flows down into these dry river beds and fills them up and he said basically Taoism, the cultivation of these three treasures is what is allowing these dry riverbeds to get filled. Normally, most of us will go through our whole life and never feel them. They're dry. They, they haven't had water fluids in them since you're in your mother's womb. When you came out of your mother's womb, they cut the umbilical cord, and you now you're in this flux. To, for a while, infants keep doing embryonic breathing. But as they start developing anxiety, they start developing what they call natural breathing. It's the exact opposite. Not that that's bad. It's just that, you know, think about it. When we do a task and then we go, <sighs> right, right, right. That's how we develop it. We vent our anxiety with breath. So over time we start, but that breath is really helpful. So in Taoism, they say everybody starts with this natural breathing. And then you cultivate and you got to use embryonic breathing. But once you accomplish your goal, go right back to natural breathing because that's where you're going to be, you develop the most tranquility in because it is a venting of anxiety. So, uh, you know, these, all these things, when we start talking about Kundalini yoga and internal alchemy are one and the same. Different semantics, different focuses on different aspects of it, but it is one and the same. What they call shushma, we call reverting jing to restore the brain. Yeah, different cultures and times, sure. Different yeah, and, analogies and symbols. But you know, I'm also I'm kind of convinced. I think I'm I'm not really sure about this, but it seems to me that the internal alchemy school of Taoism did borrow a lot from India. Yeah, from the, it seems Vajrayana. Yeah, place. yeah, and uh, well, we can't prove it, but right. then again, there's the other side of that coin: is right. all right. spiritual experiences, right. even if they're totally separate, yeah, yeah, kind of come to the same conclusion. Yeah, but then I've seen, like, I interviewed um, Olivia Cohn, and I read her book on uh, Dao Yin, and there's practices of. The cauldron and the heat in the in the lower abdominals that way predates any Vajrayana in in, in India. So it's like it yeah. seems like there was a conversation between individuals for you know a thousand years going back and forth. And instead of trying to say India or China, mm -hmm. like you know there yeah. were people traveling, talking, having discussions about these things. Yeah, I I, I agree with it. Mm -hmm. I just have sometimes I, I'm I'm. Uh, reserved about saying that's true. Well, yeah. How can you? Yeah, it's I, not... I guess it's in text she's found. I mean, we they found. Yeah, maybe. 
Yeah. Yeah. But but the advanced nadon like you're talking about definitely seems to have very similar taste. Well, yeah, that and, and that's again, you know, there's different you gotta be careful about this. Because, you know, it's what I'm talking about and what I teach and what I learned had to do with fluids of the body. It's a water element practice. Then you get to Dumo. And it's fire. It's all about drying up. You know, you got to look at different systems and what they're kind of promoting. And well, the in the Dumo, they have the heat, but it's moving the liquids. Yes. But what I'm saying is what they're, when they start talking about producing purely heat, because there's a difference. This is why you don't find Dumo down in Southeast Asia with the monks. They don't need it. Dumo was created because these guys are 14,000 feet up in the mountains and they're wearing a loincloth even during winter. They better learn how to heat the body. Yes, water and fire are always going to be the elements of cultivation. It's just that some traditions put one a little, like Dumo is thinking more of the fire element and internal alchemy is thinking more of the water element. But they both make use of fire and water. That's why Taoist books are, oh, yeah, they're always filled with that imagery of, you know, fire and water, which is another way of saying Ching and Qi. You know, Ching is water, Qi is fire. So, uh, but no, I, I, I'm not trying to contradict anything here. I just saying, oh no, no, this just a. I, I get a, like I said, I. There's all sorts of, you can get so involved yeah, yeah. in kind of the historical background of all this stuff that you don't, what, what, what good is that in the end? You're right. You're not cultivating. You're being, you know, academic about it. Mm -hmm. Great academics serve a purpose. Yeah. Uh, but there's some sort of point, though. So I, I'm 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 with you. I agree. But then there's this other sense that like because we are in the West and we're adopting these practices, they're coming in waves, and it's not just from one tradition. It's like we're getting China, India, Japan, yeah. all these different traditions. So it's like, like you said, there can be a it can smack of inauthenticity depending on where it's coming from. And so there is a sense that like, well, you know, you don't want to waste your time and practice something. It turns out to have no real basis, you know, somebody's interpretation and a misunderstanding. Right. right. So the yeah. thing, I get why that's so important right now. Being a, like, like with the Westerners, like, well, if I'm doing Tai Chi or Qigong and I'm viewing my body from a point of like, you know, the mechanical view of the body of Western anatomy of muscles and bones only, how deep am I going to be able to get in that practice if I don't understand the fluids, interstitium, I don't understand Qi or anything like that? It's like, there's kind of going to be. I need to know something, and it has to be valid. Would um, you agree? Yeah, and I'm going to make a point here that will help you with this. All the I've, I've went through numerous, translated a number of them, of internal alchemy books. In the end, I see them purely. These are bulleted lists. I know that sounds odd, but they really are, because these were text that were written by a teacher for his disciples. And the part that we forget about in Chinese culture is everybody had to protect, you know, it's, it's why, like in the martial art world, a family would not teach the daughter their martial art because they knew she'd get married and go to another family and she might teach it to them and then they'd come back and beat them up. I mean, there's this real thing in China about secrecy and keeping things within your school that's why you know i could go and we could open up you know way paul young and all these guys and they'll say they'll use instead of saying fire and water they say a three-legged crow in the sun and a jade rabbit in the moon what is that going to tell anybody who wasn't learning from that teacher so a lot of these texts when they start talking about oh the origins of this and that I look at Texas, these were, uh, you can't really trust them unless you have a teacher who can interpret what those terms meant. So cauldron and 
stove and all these, to us, they don't really have a lot of meaning because these were terms that were used to protect a teaching. So if the documents got outside the school, nobody could steal the method. They were very protective. Uh, many ways still are, but that's why you know, I kind of have trouble with somebody says, oh, this old text says this. And I'll go, well, you got to know who wrote it, why they wrote it, and what they meant by it. It's not a question of just saying, oh, this is a reality and this goes way back and all that. That's all fine. That's all academic and great. I'm in agreement with it. I'm just saying on a practice level, uh, I got to figure out what the hell this teacher is talking about. History doesn't doesn't matter here. What it matters is for me to know. Sure. Teachers and language are very important. in Because they are. They're bulleted lists. They're not, and here's, I'll finish this with, there's not one internal alchemy book that really tells you the first stage called laying the foundation. There's a few words about it, and they talk about replenishing the ching and the chi, but they're not very specific. Because the reason for that, when the teacher wrote the text, he had all these students, this is what they were already doing. He had no reason to go over laying the foundation in detail. That was something they, you know, he had been teaching for years. All internal alchemy books start out, there's four stages. Laying the foundation, transmuting ching into chi, chi into shun, shun into the void. All the internal alchemy books basically start with transmuting ching into chi. They're telling you about the fluids of your body, and you've got to get that uh, transmuted into chi, because then chi will open up the shun, and then the shun will uh, help you uh, realize the void. Ah, here we are. That's exactly where Zen starts. At the last stage, they're trying to enter the void. So they're not doing these previous things of, of you know, Lane Foundation, Ching and Chi stuff. They're just not doing it. They used to with Bodhidharma, but they don't anymore. Uh, but that's what, so I, I, you know, even reading these texts, I'm always kind of, uh, I'm a little bit on guard about the fact that I know that this teacher, because every internal alchemy book I've been through, they're basically saying the same thing, but even they use different terminology. And they're all borrowing from each other. That's the other problem. You know, and, and the Chinese, if the Chinese are good at one thing, it's wild history. They're very good at it. And they've done it, and they do it all the time. Uh, and so I get, it isn't that I'm, I doubt all of it. It's a, it's a question of looking at it, you know, just because a text says, you know, there's a cauldron, um, you know, because other texts will say it's a dragon. Another text will say it's a golden ball. Another text will tell me it's a immortal fetus, you know, on and on and on and on. Just like the Dantian, I, you know, I remember once I went through and just figured out, there's 360 different terms for the Dantian, not just one, you know, but it is, in my opinion, the Dantian is that second brain that's where it resides so so thank you that's really helpful so but then so on this book so because we i think we've gone quite a bit over <laughs> so, <Love book. laughs> uh, so yeah can we sort of maybe finish up with this so like it's it's very short the actual translation, not the book, but your the actual right. mind seal. And so essentially what we've been talking about is what it's about, correct? Yes. Ching, Chi, and Shun. Starts yeah. out right away. First line, three yeah. components. Ching, Chi, and Shun. And then it takes you through the fact that you have to replenish those. Mm -hmm. That you have to cultivate these three components in your body. And if you do that, you end up in a very good position to experience what they, in Taoism, they'll call 
immortality. But but spiritual in front of that first. But the idea is that that's that's why you cultivate. You're trying to wake up this original spirit, which was there before you were born. It's here now while you're alive, and it'll be there after you die. That's what's transmigrating through. That's your spiral. And we, when we can wake it up, when we can realize it, deal with it, that's when we become a spiritual immortal, and death no longer has any hold on us. That's why in Taoism, if you read like Go Hun, the Bao Bu Zhu, he says there's, well, there's four kind of immortals, but he's bringing up three in his book. But he said there's what you call an earthly immortal. And these are people who learn to live to be over a hundred because they took care of themselves and their ching, their chi, and their shun. And yeah, they're considered wise and sages, etc. But then there's what they call the second one, it's called corpse freed. And that means they don't have to be reborn. They don't have to come back to this place. That they they don't get a corpse anymore. That they'll just be a, a pure spiritual immortal. And then there's what they call heavenly immortal, and that's uh, where they uh, actually, in a celestial sense, take on duties and they continue their cultivation because they want to become a golden immortal, which is very in explanations it's similar to being a buddha so uh, those two they they almost you know Taoism and buddhism are about that far apart they really are the idea here is you know we basically the jade emperor's book is is purely about cultivating these these three treasures and it's giving you um, different, you know, I, one of my favorite lines in it is where it says, uh, one attainment is eternal attainment. Meaning, once you experience certain things, you don't have to experience them again. Uh, and we shouldn't be looking at cultivating as a constant. You know, like I said, I experienced this reverting jing to the brain. You know, uh, I don't need to experience that again. Because I can close my eyes and see it whenever I wish, because it was there with me. Just like a lot of things in my life, things not even spiritual. You know, uh, I was, you know, my joke on this one is it's true, but I was hit by a train in 1988. I don't need to get hit by a train again. I can close my eyes and know exactly what took place. <laughs> I'm not going to work towards reliving that. Uh, and uh, spiritual experiences are kind of the same. But we don't need to, we need to, yes, cultivate. But not look for experiences. That experience desire really hurts us. It's better to just sit, or if you do Tai Chi, or if you do Kung Fu, or whatever it is you're doing, Qi Gong. Just do it. But don't put this frustration and anxiety on yourself to have an experience. You know, and I can honestly say most of my good experiences with Qi Never happened during practice. They happened while I was taking a nap or something that was really relaxed. You know, sitting by a lake, just relaxing. I had experiences. So, you know, this is, I, you know, aside from the fact that I wrote the book, I really wish people, I mean, I, I know, I forget how many thousands of copies have sold of that, but. I just, I just think it's a very worthwhile thing for people to read, even if they're not into Taoism. Because I think it's important for us to know that because too many spiritual practices are just based on spiritual things. You know, I remember once I read this article 
and was this was written way back uh, before the time of the Revolutionary War. Some Native American woman wrote where she said, and she predicted this. I'm just telling you what she said. Is she said that these new people coming to our lands, they only believe in heaven, and that's why they won't like us because we also believe in the earth. <laughs> Meaning, there has to be a balance. That's why the Taoism are always saying heaven and earth. We need both. We need to uh, cultivate ourselves physically as much as we do spiritually. And therefore, yoga, all of these things are part of that. These are all different cultures learning to express this kind of earthly sense and conduit of their spirituality. Tai Chi is, Kung Fu is, Yoga is, you know. Uh, you can go on and on with those. You know, the dervishes with their dance. All of that is about expressing a spiritual energy inside of themselves physically. Because if we don't get it there, it's almost impossible to get it in our mind anyway. Uh, That's a good note to, to end on, especially the fact now with the environment and everything. It's a, it's a very important time, I think, to what you just said to people for, to take heed of that and come back to the body and the earth. And find this balance. Yeah. It's, uh, well, thank you so much. Hey, this was fun. It was a nice conversation. Yeah. Well, keep your fluids intact, buddy. <laughs> 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 the most Taoist thing I can tell you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much, it was really a pleasure meeting you, too. Wonder wonderful. Thank I enjoyed you. doing this. All right. Bye bye.